Hello everybody and thank you for joining me on the Autism Live Show. We're going to be talking about all different types of disabilities and conditions every Monday at 8pm and I'm joined by my special guest today, it's Sharon. Hello Sharon, thank you for joining me. Hi Kevin, nice to speak to you tonight. And can you tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do? Right, well... I'm the founder of Campaign for Disability Awareness. Um, this is set up on Facebook and Twitter. It's it's sort of really about getting people to have a unique insight into the world of disability, physical and invisible disabilities. This is also a way of raising awareness through the media as well. Um, I also am the founder of Listen to Me, which is a site which is for ME awareness. And I have three children, Jack, 16, who's autistic. And then I've got Stacey and Shannon and they're twins. They're 11. And Shannon's the reason why I raise awareness for ME, because Shannon has ME herself. So that's why I raise awareness for that. She has ME and cerebral palsy, which is spastic diplegia. So that's why I do what I do. Yeah, so tell us a little bit first about uh, Jack, about his autism. Tell me, when, right. did he, when did he get diagnosed and what sort of challenges have you faced as a parent? Right. A um, well, with Jack, he I guess you'd say he got diagnosed relatively early, um, at five years old, which I know in today's you know, the today society, that is quite a young age. So I feel extremely lucky there. Um, with his autism, it sort of started sort of coming out a bit when he was three years old, mm -hmm. and it also it come it was becoming much more prominent to us that there was some difficulties. Um, and they were getting much more when I was carrying the girls, the twins. Um, and that was quite, quite shocking. Obviously, he was dealing with his mum being pregnant, but he wasn't just dealing with his mum being pregnant. I was carrying twins. So that was confusing in itself, as mm. you can imagine. And he just sort of, he was very confused. that every, Everything had to be perfect. Like, he had a fixation on cars. He was incredible. I used to call him my mini Jeremy Clarkson because... Mm. He could he could tell a car just by looking at the front of the bumper. Mm -hmm. Didn't need no no. You know he was amazing. So you know he sort of had that gift and that knowledge of understanding things that you know just by the visual impact of it. Mm -hmm. But the other side of it, if he had toy cars out, they had to be lined perfectly. He had fascinations which turned into obsessions and there was always a thing that if we left the house Jack would fill his pockets and it could be like little trinkets but we couldn't leave the house <laughs> unless Jack filled his pockets yeah. and then we'd go we'd go to nursery and they'd have to open up his you know open out his pockets and take it out and then give it back to me at the end of the day or we wouldn't leave nursery oh, so it was you know it was just basically because um he sort of had like I wouldn't say he had language difficulties because he didn't at home. He was always very advanced in how he spoke. But in school, he would come under interaction communication difficulties. So they would say, because he would be sort of like moot and wouldn't, you know, speak and engage properly. Mm -hmm. But at home, it was the total opposite. He would be talking to us on such a grown-up level. Um, so there was a lot of frustration with him because he had to... I would say keep this sort of sort of everything he wanted to say until he got home. And I always found he was a bit like a fizzy bottle. He would just like explode. So, you know, from all the experience of the day, it would really impact him. And it was just, you know, it was a lot of emotional pressure on him to try and fit into the world and understand it. So does he go to mainstream school or is he at special school? Um, Jack went to mainstream up until um, sort of the sort of primary year five and then he went into year six into a special school and he just done brilliant there. He done so well. The school was just incredible how they listened to his needs and they brought 
they really brought the best out of him, I would say. And now he's 16 and he's in college. Oh, brilliant. So, so I feel so, really out. So what's he doing at college? Well, he's doing what they call the life skill course. So he's gone on to sort of um, where they can tr sort of get him prepared for work. He's doing like a range of like vocational options. So for the first year, he'll be doing that and then sort of working out what sort of things he wants to take, look into further. But Jack's always been very good with his hands, with building things, always very, um, sort of very good with like understanding the sort of concept of how things work, so to speak. So I think that's sort of the route he may go into. And of course, he loves cars still. So it could be the mechanical route as well. Brilliant. And we just got a message in from Chris. He says, well done, Sharon. Thank you for sharing your day today life that's and okay your it's welcome way of life so tell me a little bit about your other children well as i said shannon and stacy are identical twins seven minutes apart and that's really just literally it just seven minutes apart life with them i mean everybody calls twins double trouble anyway but life with them has been um, a bit of a roller coaster to say the least, mainly because Shannon, she at nurse sort of nursery age, we realized there was something not right, and she got the diagnosis of having cerebral palsy, uh, spastic diplegia. This was mild, luckily, but in her feet, and it would affect the way she would walk. She would need like special shoes, um, and it would mean it all the muscles were quite stiff in her feet when she was walking. So she did get her diagnosis of that and she got her special shoes and then everything was great. You know, we were going along quite nicely. And then it was at the end of foundation that Shanna started to show really, I would say, very confusing signs. Um, already having a son with autism, my first thoughts was she's getting upset, she's getting emotional, she's responding different, this has got to be autism. So I obviously that was the route I went first and then found out she wasn't autistic. There was no, you know, there was no need to think that they checked her out and they said, no, there's no autistic traits here. But then by the time she hit year one, things really, really deteriorated and her whole primary life, because unknown to us, she was starting to develop the symptoms of ME. Um, and unknown to us, this was like an ongoing thing. Deterioration was becoming a regular thing for her primary life. It was spent with her having MRIs, constant blood tests, um, literally every test possible because during that time she was a little girl that was debilitating so fast and we were out of our mind with worry. We didn't know what was going on with her. Mm -hmm. It was just a really shocking time as you you know, you can imagine she's she's got her twin sister doing everything and there's and she's just literally not able to keep up mm -hmm. and stay well enough to enjoy the same childhood really. So you know. So what's education been like for her and what's what is school been like for Shannon? School for Shannon, um, primary has been non assistant because with Emmy it's a very complicated illness I mean uh, it's sort of a neuro neurological illness but it's also got tendencies to be a complex and debilitate a multi-system chronic disease which is really a complicated disease and um, even though it is so complex it's also not recognized enough and it worldwide with ME now they're the last figure known was 17 million people in this world had ME wow. and 250,000 in the UK alone. And that you're going back, that's an old figure. So I wouldn't like to estimate what there is now. And the way ME works is if I could explain it like if you put a battery, you know, put your phone in a battery charger mm -hmm. and you charge that phone, that ch phone's supposed to go to 100%. But with ME, it would never... You never go to the full percentage of your energy. So you're always like, say, you know, in the severest forms, you could be like 10, 20 percent. And at that level, that literally means your life 
is and it always is even to the mild levels you're always living with keeping your energy balance so a day shopping for shannon would mean a, you know at that time in the bad times it would mean a day in bed the next day and this is how it would be this is how it is for so many people with me the symptoms range from in shannon's case she was vomiting up to 50 times a day um she would be lethargic she would be in pain she would be burning but you can have up to 60 symptoms in you know saying because also it's known as chronic fatigue but you can't actually just say i mean i when i say to people oh i i feel a bit tired but it's it's more than tiredness it's a really debilitating illness that totally floors people so does she get and this any, is so does shannon she get any was medication to help her condition no, this is this is the thing because Emmy's such an unrecognised illness and doesn't get the support and the funding, like you know, like other illnesses do. With Emmy, there is no known cause as yet. They're still now doing biomedical research um, and trying to find out the cause. So, because you haven't got a cause, you certainly don't have the cure. So, literally, the only way you can manage Emmy today is by pacing. Um, which is saving your energy. You're constantly watching your energy levels. So if she does a high energy thing, which I'm talking about maybe going out to the going out for a visit, that would be accompanied then by having to do a lot of like laying down, watching an old movie, reading a book, um, looking at pictures in a book, you know, just something that wouldn't take the brain's function so much. So everything with Emmy is about balancing your energy and making sure you don't overdo it because if you do you're really going to pay for it so and in, in the early that's part, how it the, works in the early part of uh, being diagnosed and assessed you, you, am, am i right in saying this you didn't know what was wrong with her didn't know no we were out of our wits and because she was sleeping in school um she was in pain she was burning up feverish um the test work as said because there's no known cause there's the blood test come back clear so you don't actually get a answer in your blood test so then you're thinking well you know why is she getting ill if the doctors are going to be oh she's fine look the blood test is clear so you start wondering what on earth's going on and you know it it just becomes a constant battle to get answers and it just carries on until you can really get to the right people to talk to and but it takes a lot of persistence to actually get understood and listened to enough to sort of get the answers. So was it a, a consultant who diagnosed Shannon or was it a, a series of tests? or? It, well, it's sort of, um, I think you've got to have this illness for this sort of symptoms for over a, long, a certain period of time. And she was getting no better. So I sort of got, to the point where I was thinking, like, if all right, if this isn't sure, maybe it could be I don't know something on the range of fibromyalgia because my grand because her grandmother has that. So I was starting to look at those sort of fields, the more invisible side. I was like researching every night just to find some answers, and that's when the consultant that we were working with at the time said, "I'm going to refer you to a um, rheumatologist," and that's the first time them when we sort of like sat down with someone and she said, look, I know Shannon's very young, but the symptoms you're presenting, she's presenting to me, which I normally see in my more like teenage patients, sounds like ME. And that was the first time someone actually said the words ME to us. And then obviously, you know, she, we sort of had that to go with. So we pushed and pushed to try and get to see more of a specialist hospital, which are the ones that diagnosed it in the end. And we've got a picture on screen at the moment of Shannon holding a frame with a, a oh, picture yes. of the Herald. So tell us a little, a little bit about this. Yeah, um, Shannon, bless her, she's won the Pride of Plymouth Young Child Hero Award twice now. Wow, amazing. Which is incredible. Um, she, the first time, was um, she couldn't attend the event which, um, you know, it was just too much. Her health was in that level where she couldn't, she was in bed before 
because obviously it was an evening event. She was in bed before it happened. So I had to tell her the next day. And then she went to the Herald office and picked up her award. Um, the second time was just incredible. Shannon was well enough and we did attend the event, as you've seen. And she wore that beautiful red dress, which she was so proud of. And it was just incredible. She got to pick her award up for herself. And it was just an amazing night. And it gave us hope because it made us think Emmy hasn't beaten us yet because here she is getting her award that she so deserved for all the work she's done to raise awareness for it. And, oh, it was just amazing, a night to remember. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And we've got another article on screen here about uh, players uh, with different perspectives on disability. So just tell us a little bit about the workshops, what you've been doing to educate people around disabilities to, uh, you know, to raise uh, awareness of ignorance of people understanding disabilities. Yeah. Um, Yeah, well, as I said, I found a campaign for disability awareness I founded it when I was dealing with, um, got Jack diagnosed with autism. That's all I knew I was, you know, my children had at that time. Shannon's came out a lot later. Um, It was just because I felt that people needed to understand all types of disabilities, invisible and physical, um, in a sense that they would have a unique experience. So this is where the workshops come out. They're called Step Into My Shoes Workshops and they just come around because of that reason and it's just been great because I've been able to bring these workshops where I don't know if you can see the players have got the glasses on have everything, haven't they? It's like a range of disability aids that yeah. the people will use and they will use them in the sense that I'm because I deal with a lot of children on my workshops, so I, I want to make it. I want to make it a fun, enjoyable experience because I believe it's got to be visual. It's got to entertain, but still drive the message home how important it is to understand. But people, if they're learning about it in the sense that they're enjoying it, especially children, they are going to walk away with that bit better understanding because they're going to remember it more. And that's where it comes from. So I've got games, I've got physical sports and people come and they have a great time, but they're at the same time getting an insight that, you know, it's it's only, you know, it's an insight. I know it's not like living it 24 seven, but it's an insight that I have found to have a great impact when people take part. You know, I, I find that people are like, oh, blimey, this, you know, I can't. I can't believe it. I can't see properly because we've got special visual impairment glasses. We've got hand adaptions. Um, I've now working on, I've, I've got like, I don't know if you can see any of this, but I've got like a weighted jacket and a neck brace and everything. So now I've be, been able to find it very successful getting across invisible disabilities. Yeah, so on screen at the moment now we've got a young yeah. man with a pair of dark yeah. sunglasses on. He's got yeah. a, a, a neck uh that's it, like yeah. An echo on his son, and he's got yeah. some sort of mechanism. I'm not sure what it is. He's, he's gripping it on his arm. Yeah, that's it's like, like a an arm. Yeah, that's it. And if and it's to make him bend his hand because when he bends his hand, it will actually show how limited muscles become because it's set up in a way that it will limit his hand movement. With a neck brace, will actually show him how uncomfortable it is if you've got something done to your neck, especially like fibromyalgia, Emmy, it really is good at impacting that. And the the sort of waistcoat, not so trendy waistcoat, I say, but that is weighted and that is fantastic with the neck brace um, to really show the impact of Emmy fibromyalgia because it shows how weighted the body becomes, how tired it becomes. And then on top of that, with the neck brace pulling down, people do find that one really uncomfortable, but it really gets the message home. And then obviously the glasses he's wearing are, again, to show the way eyesight can go when you have an invisible disability, the type of brain fog you can suffer with and and everything like that. That young lad that you've got the picture of, he's actually from the National Citizen Service workshops I'd done, which I'd done this summer. 
and I work with 500 teenagers and give them an insight into disability awareness again with the workshop. They've done sports, they've done writing activities. They, you know, they had a blast. We've done it in a fun way, but I think they did walk away with a lot more knowledge of what disabilities are about. And it was quite a great feedback. You know, they loved it. They, they really enjoyed the experience. And on screen so at the moment, we've got uh, Shannon puts the record straight on me, and I believe that she's been a local hero, local star down south, and she's been on radio. And tell us a little bit about this viral video. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Shannon sort of, there was, there's, as I said, Emmy is so misunderstood. There's all this concept that Emmy is a psychological different, a psychological problem. It's in the patient's mind. They would want to be this ill, which is absolutely ridiculous. They would want to be laying in bed. They wouldn't want to be part of life. Um, this is tends to be what Emmy sufferers in general get, and, you know, and this is, again, what Shannon, I was told about Shannon when there was no answers. I was told Shannon likes the attention. This is how Shannon, you know, this is Shannon. This is the way she is. She's a bit of an attention seeker. Um, she's going to be the type of child that want to wear bandages in the future. I mean, some really crazy things I got told that this little girl didn't want a childhood. She just wanted to be an ill child for attention which was quite shocking. And with Emmy, there is a thing with the PACE treatment. And on the day that Shannon done that video, the PACE treatment is all about, um, and the lightning process, it's all about, again, the concept of if you exercise, it'll make you better. If you think positivity, it'll make you better. It's all on that sort of concept that this is the way Emmy sufferers get better. Um, I mentioned it to Shannon because it was all big news on the day. Mm-hmm. And she just done this video. The, you know, I just said, do you want to say something? And we just put it out there. We know quite a few people on the Emmy site. So I thought, you know, we might give them a bit of, they were all feeling quite down on that day because, again, it was belittling Emmy and what they suffer. So we put it out there and it just went crazy. We just thought we might get a hundred people might like Mm-hmm. might like it <laughs> might comment oh this is good and it just went crazy uh, news media picked up on it she got converted to holland uh, the article the herald article that went out that got converted to holland to spanish oh, wow. <laughs> um it was crazy um she just talked from the heart she talked about that you know this illness you know this is not an illness in our heads we can't just think ourselves better and the emmy community loved it you know it was what they needed to hear at that time and they said she's their emmy hero and she went on tv um she was just amazing she just talked from her heart and said you know this we've got to all stand together we all got to agree that you know they don't let them bring us down she just she was amazing she really was i was so proud it was incredible. So what do you think uh, would happen if there wasn't any support for Shannon, if there was no support for her, Emmy? What, what would you think would happen? I think, oh, what you mean if I never got the diagnosis? Yeah, if you didn't get the as diagnosis. As well, if there was no answers. Would you have gone oh. private or would you have taken her to some specialist? To, you know, oh, I to think, yeah, her? we would have... Yeah, we would have had to really go searching. Um, the scary thing for me, um, and for all ME sufferers really, is if no one could come up and give us the answer, this is what it was. In Shannon's case, I would have actually, as a, as a mum, not known it unwittingly, been making her more ill because I would be letting her watch a programme on TV because this is before I knew she, about the pacing and any of that so I was letting her watch a new program and all I would have been doing really is burning out her energy because that would have been new and exciting I would have been like just not knowing that pacing is the only way to keep her well um you know you I would have had to literally well she would have got sicker there is no doubt about that if no one could have given me answers Mm. um I would have had to go searching um 
you know, I knew, I knew inside there had to be more than what I was being told. It couldn't just be a little girl wanting attention. And, you know, I just thought this this can't be right. And it was hard for Shannon because she had a twin sister and she looked at me one day and she turned around and she said, Mum, she's got my face, but she's not ill like me. I mean, she was only tiny at the time. And, you know, that was quite a thing for a young child to say. Why is she not ill? She looks like me, but why am I ill? It, because of her being so identical, it was very difficult on both girls. It really did make an impact on both girls. Eve, you know, Stacey felt guilty. She was worrying about her sister. And, yeah, without any sort of support and knowing about the ME sites that's out there, which are absolutely fantastic, and there's such a loving, warm community, we wouldn't have... We wouldn't have been. I don't know where we'd be. I dread to think. So it'd be Sharon, shocking. Sharon, if anybody's watching this now, and I'm sure people are, is there any national website where people can access to get support for Emmy if they think they may may have Emmy? Yeah, my advice to anyone watching it is to go and. I mean, we're lucky. We've got the internet, so go to the Emmy Association. Um, you know, just Google in. Emmy, Emmy, um, it is actually called, I probably won't say this right, but it is called myalgic encephalitis, myalitis, which is really a mouthful. That's why I don't say it very often. It's easier to say <laughs> Emmy. But if they put that in, there is a whole host of things that will come up and give them advice. And um, there is a lot more awareness out there now. I mean, I'm working with an incredible bunch of ladies, Claire and Marie and Tony, um, from Broken Puppet Theatre and we do a lot of work in Plymouth now getting the awareness out there and we're getting surprised that many people are coming up to us and saying to us you know we've done some events locally you probably might have seen some of those pictures like when we're all dressed in blue um, it literally coming up to us and saying oh this is what I've got you know these this sounds like what I got and we didn't know there were so many people in Plymouth suffering with it but it is shocking once you start talking about it how many people this does impact but you can get a lot of support out there if you do go researching for it but it's like i said it's from the actual me sites themselves they're the ones that will offer the best guidance and support people in any way they need but it is something that if it was more recognized there was more funding more in the biomedical side rather in the pace and the other side which has had more funding than what it needed we could be a lot further along with emmy as well so it's just a hope that eventually one day we will get those answers so what's your next uh, steps with the campaigning work with uh, with your disability campaigning are you going to go into more schools and colleges yeah um i've now took on because i'm always trying um i will to take on like as much disability awareness as I can, like to show as much disability, different disabilities. I mean, we know there's a vast range of disabilities, but I'm trying to cover as much as I can, which isn't easy because there is a lot. But I've now got um, um, sort of sort of limited um, hearing headphones that I've had delivered, um, and I'm going to be doing a hearing loss workshop as well which I think, you know, I've got a special... Some people actually will come to me now and say, we're looking for this type of workshop or we want to experience this type of disability. So I'm trying to be as broad range as I can to get across as much awareness and, you know, experience for people. Um, I've got the brainies I'm working with. Um, I've got lots of great ideas. Obviously, I'm doing a lot of the Emmy work with Book and Puppet Theatre um, getting and using my invisible disability awareness kit to get that message across more in the ME side as well. Um, it's just you know I've I've got lots of like sports people I want to work with. Uh, maybe go back to Plymouth Argo with their Hevers again because mm -hmm. that was a great experience. So yeah, lots of I like to think out of the box when it comes to disability awareness, which is why I try to do events that sort of make get people thinking a bit. You know, that's, that's a bit different, like the football games and that. It it just gets people thinking, oh, there's a different way of looking at it. And it becomes entertainment, but at the same sense, it's given the serious message that, you know, look at these 
Plymouth Argo players, this, you know, they've got their skills, but when they put those glasses on, it's quite a different story. So it gets that message across in another way. So yeah, there's lots of lots of plans, and we just see what where it takes us, sort of thing. Sharon, it's been great to have you on the show, and thank you. You're for welcome. Sh- thank you for sharing thank you. your insight to Emmy and your daughter and your son. And I'm sure you'll be creating a lot more awareness out there, not just locally, nationally as well. And uh, if anybody's missed this show, they can watch it on YouTube and they can uh, recap it back on Facebook. So it will always be there for people to to watch and share. And uh, Sharon, I wish you the very best for the future. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thanks for coming on. And uh, you're welcome. I'm sure both your all your children will grow up remarkably well and do lots of amazing things. So thanks for being on the show today, Sharon. And next week, I will be joined by Mark, who's talking about autism, about the advantages and disadvantages of having autism. That's next Monday at 8pm on Autism Live Chat Show. So until then, have a great Monday and we'll see you again next week. Thanks a lot, Sharon. Take care. Thank you. Cheers.